Good show, good show. Well, welcome to Florida Supercon. Thank you. I had the privilege of meeting Chris yesterday, and it is an absolute privilege to meet you today as well. And of course, we're here to talk about the iconic The Nightmare Before Christmas. And obviously, the movie has impacted everybody in here in, in very different ways, and I've grown up with this movie. I want to know, how has The Nightmare Before Christmas impacted your lives? <laughs> Ken? Well, <laughs> uh, greatly, greatly, because I mean, when was the movie done? 1990? 91, 92. 91, yeah. 92. Well, we actually... We did the voice stuff yeah. in 91. So yeah. starting in 91, and this is 2017. So all of those years in between, between doing the work and then having the film come out and what it was when it initially uh, debuted, and then all the stuff that's happened in the interim, like this, has been really impacting. Um, I don't think I realized what the uh, following had become until probably around 96. Six, something like that. So, I mean, it's impacted my life in the way that I get to interact with all these wonderful people we meet at the conventions, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I just have to, to add to that that I, I don't think any of us really had a sense of just how much it meant to so many people uh, as when we come to these events and people walk up and say, I grew up with this movie. This movie was my companion when I was a child or when I was growing up or it somehow it gave me a sense of myself more than I had before I watched it, which is extraordinary. You don't get that sense from, from people having seen your work, um, and f obviously Tim Burton's work and Henry Selleck's work and all the great animators who worked on this movie. So uh, it, it's been extraordinary, it really has. Awesome. So I don't want to be too selfish. We do have a microphone set up right there if you guys have any questions for these two. What I will say, and that you did touch on yesterday, is you can't uh, ask them to do the specific voices because they are copyrighted by Disney. So don't waste your time saying, can you say this line like this? Can you say this line like that? They can't do it. It's just, uh, don't shoot the messenger thank thing. Thank you, yes. Sorry, so uh, sorry just that. to save you guys some time. So if you guys do have questions, now is your chance to line up at the microphone. I, unless you just want to hear me talk to them because I gladly will. Uh, do we have any willing first victims up here? Are you walking to the mic? Nobody? Walking guys. right by the mic. Come Nobody on. wants to know our Here recipe for pancakes or anything? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, see, there you go. All right. Actually, I have one. Yes. My name is Helen, and I am from Boca Raton. I, I thank you for both coming today. I know it's for Nightmare Before Christmas, but I'm here for you. I want to be able to say that I was able to meet you in person. Um, I grew up in the 80s watching Fright Night. Um, and Princess Diary, and it's just a pleasure to Princess be able to, Bride. Pr Princess Bride, sorry, I'm nervous. It's okay. <laughs> Princess Diaries is great too. I know, That's a different sorry. panel, yes. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so it's a pleasure meeting you in person. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Um, I'm Ethan. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't need to get this out of the way. Like, she did, like, when I heard you both were coming to this, pan like, to this convention the same day, I freaked out out because like it's always been my dream to meet like like you guys like you Chris and especially you Ken like I'm sorry but Oogie Boogie I, I I'll say this more when I meet you at your booth I'm sorry I'm, I'm almost tearing up okay so I, I <laughs> thank you thank you you're quite welcome yeah. so I actually do have maybe kind of a two-part question is that all right go ahead yeah. go for it okay, go ahead. so please First of all, for both of you, like, I kind of brought this up a bit yesterday, like, so you both have kind of come back to do your characters at certain points, especially for the video games, and one that I'm particularly interested in is the Nightmare Before Christmas Oogie's Revenge, because that was almost sort of, like, a sequel to the Nightmare Before Christmas, so I was wondering, like, if you had any, like, experiences with that, like, especially because I know like one special thing I love about the game is like Jack and Oogie sung like duets in that game and which they never did in the movie so like any experiences you can share about that like any feelings did we sing duets in that <laughs> no I wish <laughs> I, I wish so. uh the only thing I could say is I mean you know to be honest with you there's so many different things we've done I hardly remember the revenge to be honest yeah but um 
I just think it was great. If, that was like the first one or something like that. But at any rate, it was just great to revisit it and to realize that, that Oogie, the, li- the voice, the character, was going to have more life. You know, you finish the movie, the movie came out, the movie was over, you know. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you realize there's video games that are going to happen, there's stuff at the park and things like that. So it really uh, awakened me, at least. My, the biggest thing I remember about it is it, it, it made me uh, believe that it was going to continue. There would be other things connected with it. Thank you, Ethan. Oh, um, I had an... Oh, he has uh, another question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this one's for Ken. Like, Chris, you brought up yesterday, like, you kind of met with Tim, like, during post-production of Night Before Christmas, like, to touch up your line. So I was going to wonder, Ken, like, have you ever really met with Tim Burr, and if so, are there any experiences you can share? Uh, I met him later. I didn't meet with him in connection with making the film. I met him after, actually. And it was funny because, you know, I knew who he was, but he didn't necessarily know who I was. And I said, uh, Tim, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I said, I- I'm the Oogie Boogie. He went, oh, my God. And we hugged and embraced it because we'd never met each other through all. And this was later on. This wasn't like right after the film came out. This was maybe a year or two after. And we had never met. I've now, of course, seen him two or three times over different events and things. But it was for me. I was really, because, I mean, it came from his original story. I'm a big fan of his anyway, not just because of Nightmare Before Christmas. So I was like totally, you know, being a fangirl about <laughs> it, you know. And uh, it was great to meet him, though. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Let's just try to keep it to one question so we can try to get through as many questions as possible. Okay. Um, this is for Ken Page, then, since my first question was about both of you, but I can't do two questions. Um, do you prefer the deleted ending of Nightmare Before Christmas where uh, uh, Dr. Frankenstein was Oogie, or do you prefer the the ending that they have now where Oogie Boogie just gets turned into s- snakes and spiders too? You want to know something? I've never seen that other ending. I haven't either. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Um, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but Dr. Frankenstein was... Um, Oogie Boogie the entire time in the deleted ending. Oh, okay. No idea. Yeah. Oh, I didn't either. <laughs> right. On yeah, the Blu-ray. On the Blu-ray. Okay. What is it, an alternate ending? Yeah, it's an Blu-ray? alternate ending. Cool, cool. I will look at it and I'll get back to you. So will I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Thank for you. the next panel. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? My name's Josh. Flip uh, up the mic. There you go. Thank you. Uh, I'm actually an artist over in Artist Alley, and that was one of the things I wanted to thank you guys for, is you guys bringing those characters to life really inspired me to improve my art and to really go for it, because I was really second-guessing myself a lot as a kid. Um, and it's one thing to see the puppets and the artwork being made, but when you guys bring them to life with your voices and everything else, I also like doing voices myself, so it's something I've kind of learned a lot from all that. Um, I don't know if it's okay with you guys or not, but I drew these for you, and I'm not going to have a chance to get to the panels because I'm working the whole weekend. <laughs> so I had these for you, and I just wanted to give them to you. Oh, thank okay. you. Thank you. That'll be all right? Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to hold them up? Let's see them. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Great work. Thank you very what much. Was, what was your name again? Josh. Josh. You're an artist alley. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. These are beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes. What's your name? Corinne. Hi, um, Corinne. My question is for Ken Page. Um, Cats was the very first musical my mom ever took me to see, right. and it inspired me to get into musical theater. And I wanted to ask, um, what was the best part about being part of the production of Cats? Um, hmm. Well, at the time, I think the best part of it was we were bringing something, more or less, as we've said about Nightmare Before Christmas, to life that a lot of people had heard a lot about because the show had opened in London and people were really expecting it to be and expecting this and expecting that. So it was really a great experience to be at the center of something like that happening. I mean, it was a real sort of uh, media thing as well. I think it was the first show that probably had as much media attention 
as far as magazines and da -da 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 -da, they kept, everybody wanted to know about it and, and what it was going to be. On this end, I think it's, it's very similar to Nightmare Before Christmas in that I'm very proud to be part of something that has gone worldwide and uh, been all over and it continues. The Broadway revival is still running for another couple of months. We did a DVD version of it in 97, I think it was, something like that. So it's really like Nightmare Before Christmas. It's grown into this huge, huge, I hate to use the word brand. I hate that word. But it kind of has, you know. So for me, it's just great to be part of it and have been at the inception of it and know that it has been passed down to so many wonderful people. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank so you. Much. Thank you. What's your name? Hi, I'm Issa. Hi, I'm Issa. Uh, I wanted to say first, my aunt, she wanted to be here today. It's her birthday, and she loves you guys. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask a question for her. So because she has this really big tattoo on her leg, I was curious if there was anything, nightmare, any other work that you've done related that you've seen from another fan that was really weird, like a tattoo or art or anything. Anything at all. <laughs> I've, I've seen people with Fright Night scenes on them. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Fright I've night? never seen any Princess Bride tattoos. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think it's the kind of movie that sort of lends itself to that, you know. I see. People carrying it around with them. But I have seen Fright Night tattoos, yeah. Oh, wow. Do you have anything too, or no? <laughs> I have one, but that's about all I can hear. <laughs> no, nothing else I've ever, there's no like tat cats tattoo or something else I've done. No, the only thing I've ever seen, it's amazing the tattoos that people have from oh, before Christmas. Yeah. All over well, them. It could be anything. I love cats as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying, I don't know anybody. I'm sure there are people that have cats tattoos somewhere. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I believe, I believe, but <laughs> I've never you. seen any. <laughs> all right. And that was it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy birthday to your mom. Your aunt. And you had your mother. <laughs> and all your relatives. Hello, my name is Eddie. And Hi, Eddie. the Nightmare Before Christmas is a very sh strange story for its time. So as a voice actor, what kind of direction did you get to shape the character? Uh, for, for me, I had uh, the template of having heard and seen Danny Elfman's songs uh, already having been created and animated. That is, he did the music, and then they did, I think I saw maybe one of the songs. So I had a real visual idea of what the movie was going to look like. Um, and that was the, the template that I used to, to create the character, which was that Jack's sort of enthusiasm and his, his depression and that sort of, what, that bipolar nature that Jack has, really. Um, and that was really the thing that guided me the most. Um, and also getting direction from Henry Selleck, who directed the movie. And then after we finished the film, I worked a little bit with Tim, and we refined some of the, the Jack stuff. Um, yeah, for me, I, I didn't get to see, you know, anything ahead, but I think it was when they asked me, because first they had, they had brought me in to do the singing, the song, and I guess somewhere in a room someplace, somebody decided I might be able to act too, I don't know, but um, they, they asked me what would be my take on it. They showed me a storyboard and, and Tim's original book and so forth, and um, my basic answer was that I thought it might be a voice somewhere between Bert Lahr from The Wizard of Oz, The Cowardly Lion, and the voice of the demon in The Exorcist. <laughs> That's kind of how I roll, you know. And they were like, okay, yeah, well, let's hear some of that. <laughs> let's see you come up with that. Let's see what that's going to be, you know. And I told them, I said, well, if I go too far in either direction, just tell me and if we settle in the middle, it won't be either, but it'll be something new, you know. So... Um, from that, then I got direction and the ideas and the intentions and things for uh, Oogie in each scene. But that was how I came to the voice. I just sort of varied between those two, and that's it. And, and if you think about it, um, the, the, the way these things are done is, I mean, I, I think it's similar circumstances for Ken is that I was called up to uh, San Francisco where the studio was, where the animation studio was, uh, and the, the sound studio, and I would go in and I would do a couple of three scenes with Henry Selleck, and we would do them over 
and over and over again. And we would do a line, and then he'd say, okay, try it this way, try it this way. And he would literally, he would give me line readings sometimes. And then, after he had all of that material, uh, any number of alternate takes for every line in the scene, then he would sit down and he would, with the animators, come up with a, with a, a through line for the scene. So in a way, we were clay in their hands, as, as were the, anim, you know, the, the uh, animatronic figures. So it was really a creation of not just the voice actors, but also the director and the animators all working together. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Oh, my name is Maggie. Um, since you guys have done voice work, and I'm as a theater major, I just want to know how it was different going from voice work to on camera or stage or whatever, different mediums. Well, you know, I just said to somebody at the table that pretty, for me it was pretty much the same. It's just that nobody sees you. That's the difference, you know. And of course you have to bring more... Um, definition into your voice performance because that's all there is until they put whatever visual there's going to be and it enhances the visual if doesn't it's you know whatever it enhances the visual um <clears throat> and on stage people can see you they see what you're doing they read your body language so on and so forth I, I just think that voice work in particular i found it really terrific because it's sort of going back to for me for to childhood and how i played at it when I was a kid, you really can go as wild and as crazy as you can possibly think of. And then they use whatever they want and the rest they throw into the scary bin and leave it in there. Uh, but it really gave me that kind of freedom. So I really appreciate that. And that you don't always have on stage, you know. Yeah, that's very, very much my take on it too, which is that there's a certain kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word exaggeration as much as uh, expansiveness uh, that, you can, that you can give to it. In, uh, in your performance in the studio that can't be too much in a way because what you see on the screen is so vivid. It's so extraordinary. I mean, the, the, the work those guys did, the visuals are just amazing. Uh, and, and the voice has to have a certain kind of heft and weight and, as you say, definition to it uh, in performance. So that's the way you approach it. Thank you. I'm Kaylee. Um, my question isn't as serious as the other people, but... Um, That's all right. <laughs> so my family, we kind of argue every once in a while whether you watch Nightmare Before Christmas at Halloween or Christmas time or just all year round. <laughs> so what's your thoughts about that? Let's take a vote. <laughs> all right, who says Christmas? Raise your hand. All right, who says Halloween? Maybe we should make it a voice vote. Yeah. Can we do both? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. Thank Both. you. I think it might be the only, I can't think of another property that spans Halloween into Christmas. Yeah. Thanksgiving? There's Thanksgiving into Christmas, there's New Year's, Christmas into New Year's. But shorter periods. Yeah, they're shorter periods. And they're not as, as, as diverse from each other as, you, as it would be. I mean, from Halloween into Christmas is a big leap. And I think that's... <laughs> And I think that's part of the genius of the story of right. it and, the, and the visual is that they actually managed to blend those. And, and if you think about it, they're both very vivid holidays. Mm -hmm. The colors are very vivid. Uh, there's orange, and there's black, and there's red, and, there's, and, and that's the case with Christmas as well. So they really are kind of complementary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arr. Hello, how are you? Arr. <laughs> when I'm not Captain Jack, I'm Adam. Uh -huh. Pleasure to meet both of you. Okay. Pleasure. Um, <laughs> would I be able to ask one of you a question each? Would that be okay? Sure. So, Quickly. Chris, for you, my family loves Princess Bride. We quote it all the time. And I was just wondering, what was it like to work with Billy Crystal? I didn't get to work with Billy. Really? Oh. But I can tell oh, you a yeah. story that Mandy Patinkin tells about working with Billy. Okay. And that is that uh, Mandy worked the entire picture up until the actual duel, filming of the duel. They rehearsed every day. Every day they worked, whether they were shooting or not. When they weren't shooting, they, they, they rehearsed. When they were shooting, they went off to the side and rehearsed while cameras were being set up for the next scene. Uh -huh. And he was never injured. Wow. He was um, injured once during the movie, during the Billy Crystal scene, because he was laughing so hard he cracked a rib. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, to replace that question then, what was it like working with Christopher Guest? Uh, great. 
uh, one, um, an amazing inve inventive actor who, on at least as far as the, the movie was concerned, play, it, is very subtle. Right. Uh, Chris's performance in that movie is very quiet and yeah. very deadly. My family also loves Spinal Tap, so... Yeah, but if you watch his other movies, he's a, he can be very flamboyant. He can be... Oh, he's, a, he's a comic I mean, genius. just with Nigel alone. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, for you, Ken, yeah. I was curious, how many takes did it take to do Oogie's song, and how was your voice after that? Huh. Not a lot. Really? Not a lot. Well, because I'm a singer, and I've been singing since I was like in the fifth grade, literally. Oh, okay. So singing to me is a, a natural thing, and it's something I'm trained at. Um, I fortunately had done a job not so many, well, it had actually been a few years before, where I had to use my voice in a certain kind of way that wasn't natural. So I studied with a, a voice coach who taught me how to do that. <clears throat> so when I came to Nightmare Before Christmas, it was very similar in terms of what I wanted to do with my voice. Mm. Um, and I think they were aware that because of what it was, the song was less taxing right. than the vocal, I mean, I mean the uh, dialogue. vocals weren't that taxing on you. I could no, the vocals weren't that taxing. They were sort of in my wheelhouse, I guess you would say, you know. So it didn't really, we didn't do, I think I did maybe two whole passes at the song. Okay. And then we went back and picked up a few lines that they wanted a specific reading on the vocal okay. with Danny Elfman. And, um, but it wasn't a lot. I mean, I just sort of studied the song and I came in and did it as if I were on stage. Nice. <laughs> and that was sort of the performance of it, which they were very interested in capturing that way. They wanted a performance, not a measured take by take by take by take. All right. It must have been brilliant working with Danny Elfman, right? It was, yeah. I imagine. A... Anyway, thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Hi, uh, my name is Ar Alberto, and uh, I got to say, it is an honor to meet you both because... Uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas is uh, one of my uh, favorite films, if not my favorite Tim Burton film. I'm a huge Tim Burton fan. And uh, if it's okay, I, I wanted to ask uh, both of you the, the same question. Uh, wh what inspired you to become a voice actor? Fate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I didn't necessarily set out, I don't think either of us did, to, to become voice actors. These, uh, this opportunity just happened to come my way, and I think I, you probably are the same. Same thing, exactly. Yeah. I think because we both come from theater training and theater of a sort, it lends itself more to that. Yeah. I think most of the early animated, especially during the, sort of golden, the new golden age with Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and all those sort of films, most of those people were stage actors who voiced most of those films. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do with the new idea of those movies was, and including Nightmare Before Christmas, was that we were giving performances right. and not just supplying voices. And I think that might have been a little bit different than the early, early years with Disney films that are all amazing and I admire and bow down to them all. But I think in that time, they were more about just doing the voice that they needed for the film. When we came along, I think they really were about performances on film. Because, like, for instance, I think it was Beauty and the Beast was thought of as the new movie musical until they started making more movie musicals, you know, uh, for that reason, that they were really performances. I'm sorry I keep forgetting about two people over here. Uh, performances that way. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. What's your name? Uh, Tony. Um, mine's not really a question. Chris? I watched Fright Night over and over again. You made vampires very sexy. Thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not like what we've got roaming around these days, but anyway, maybe I've been just a little too old for them. Um, secondly, it's a story about my three-year-old daughter who almost got thrown out of summer camp because of Nightmare Before Christmas. It was Christmas in July. She thought it was a Christmas movie. She brings it to camp. I pick her up at five o'clock and all of the mothers are glaring at me. What could possibly she have done now? You can never bring this back again. I said, why? She said, there were things with, with their heads coming off and something with its seams pulled out and bugs flew out of it. And she goes, yeah. you can never. <laughs> yeah. You could, snooty, snooty, snooty little private, you know, she never went back, by the way. Um, snooty private, and they were like mortified. And all I can think in my head was, your poor children have no idea of what they're getting. You know, like, 
Tim Burton. I'm like, the, the sounds and just the concept of the movie made my three-year-old go, Mommy, I don't know why everyone was crying. I said, it's okay, Kristen, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine that everybody was crying. I said, not everyone's going to get you, honey. So now she's 23, and she's here, and she's super excited to see you guys. And I just wanted to share that story with you because I tell everyone... She? Yeah, I was just going to say, raise your hand. There was a, a room, full, room full of kids crying. So Great. I just wanted to share that with you, and thank you so much. Thank you. you you've made her quite the weird child, but it's perfect. Weird is good. Weird is good. What's your name? Go ahead. Hello, my name is William. I just want to say, I said this to Chris at his panel yesterday, but now that you're here, I can say it to both of you. Thank you both so much for this amazing work you did on this movie that's helped shape a lot of us and carry us through our childhood. You two voiced two of my absolute favorite Disney characters, Oogie being my number one Disney villain, especially because that song that I sang so much as a child. Anyway, I also asked Chris this question, but now I can direct it directly to you. Who? I asked him, was there anyone on the film that you really enjoyed working with the whole time you were there? Any one person that just made the whole time there so much worth it? Um, well, you know, I, in terms of the actors, I recorded alone, so I really didn't get to work with anybody. Yeah, we both did. Yeah, yeah, most, everybody did. It doesn't just have to be actors. Yeah. Anyone, really. uh, but I think I would probably then say Danny Elfman, <laughs> because coming to it from a musical perspective first... Uh, you know, I knew his work otherwise, and certainly Oingo Boingo and all those kind of things. So it was a real thrill for me to get to work with him, but also to get there and find out that he was as well um, versed in music as he was. I mean, I knew he was a great musician, but his inspiration for the Oogie Boogie song was a Cab Calloway song, um, St. James Infirmary. And uh, when I saw the, the film, of the cartoon, you will say, of that song and heard it, I thought, oh, wow, he really captured it. He didn't copy it, but he captured the feeling of it, that sort of slow jazz drag. I love Yeah, he really got that into the song. So we had a, a common language that really helped me. You know, so I think that's probably the person I would say. Just I had more to do with him than anybody. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you both for all your work you did. Thank, thank you. you. We got a long line, so let's keep going. Thanks. My name's Jason, and uh, the Nightmare Before Christmas is a fantastic and revolutionary movie. And there are so many diehard fans here. You, every diehard fan has two things an absolute favorite part of that movie that they're a fan of, and an absolute least favorite part. <laughs> but you never get to hear the opinions of the actors and the people who participate in the movie. So I want to ask you, both of you, what's your least favorite and what's your favorite part of Nightmare Before Christmas? I don't have a least favorite part. <laughs> honestly, honestly. I, first time I saw it, I was with my, the, my kids who were at the time very young. They're now grown up. Uh, and they had sent me a um, a click track uh, of the movie. I mean, a uh, with a you know the time signature on the bottom, and it was in black and white. It wasn't nearly what it ended up being, but it just they wanted to show me that because I was going to go into the studio and work with Tim. And the kids were running around. They were very small at the time, and I put it into it was a video cassette, and I put it in the video cassette player, and I started it, and soon they were gathered around me watching it and they were like this <laughs> all of them and I thought from that moment on I thought this is something really extraordinary and I cannot think of a moment in my head that uh, I would say oh gee I wish they'd done that differently That's my answer I mean it's you know every time even now and I don't get to watch it that often but when I do I still see things that I have never seen so there's nothing in it that I don't love, not like love. You know, I'm looking at the background now when I look at it sometimes. Yeah, there's so much going on in every yeah, scene. Yeah, there's so much, and, and even the smallest bit of detail in, in the sets and things is something to go back and explore, just that all by itself. So I love every frame of it myself. And when you think that this movie was made literally 11 seconds a week, in the animation process was that's how much animation they turned out every week because of the minute nature of each frame being shot at the same, you know, in succession. Uh, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. 
Thank you. You're welcome. I think I even read that it said Jack had, what, 800 heads alone? I think it was 400 and something. 400 yeah. heads. Yeah. I think. I have some of them. <laughs> really? What's your name? Hi, my name's Amanda. And just going to say I'm really excited to be here. And I've, <laughs> I've loved The Nightmare Before Christmas. Could, said to be a little weird, um, in my school at least. Um, but... I heard that Disney released The Night Before Christmas under a different name before they really adapted and took it under, saying that this is ours, and they said um, that, you know, let's put it in Halloween time. How'd you guys feel about that? You know what I think you're probably re alluding to is that it came out under Touchstone. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Originally it was released under the Touchstone Production House, I don't know what you call it. And then it was re-released as a Disney film later. It became more popular. I think that's what you mean more than... It wasn't the retitle. No, it wasn't retitled. It was always The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. Okay, but how'd you guys feel about that? Like thinking, oh, Disney. <laughs> you know, we have so little to do with the, yeah, we, you know, the distribution and how they decide to release movies that, uh, you know, once our work is done, essentially you're just, oh, I hope it's good. And it was. <laughs> it was Thank nice you. To, to see Disney on it. I mean, yeah. you know, because Disney has such a known commodity of, of animated films and so forth. So to have it come back and it was Disney's Nightmare Before Disney's Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas. It was kind of like, I always say we made it into the big castle. You know, <laughs> we were out in some little, some little cottage out on the side there for a while. Thank you, Amanda. All right, we only got about 10 minutes left. What's your name? I'm Cody. Um, first off, it's good to see you guys because Oogie's one of my favorite villains of all. He did awesome as the Oogie Boogie song. <laughs> but um, what was it like getting to work with the Tim Burton film? If you guys ever got to meet him. <laughs> I got to meet him uh, toward the end. But, but it, was, uh, it was a great experience. I'm, uh, you know, all the, 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 the work that was done over the two, and, two years and some that the movie took uh, was so extraordinary and, and uh, it's a tribute to the fact that it was, you know, the original idea was Tim's, the original story was Tim's, the book, the, the little book of Nightmare Before Christmas was Tim's, um, that you can't help but be, you know, in, in awe and admiration for that. Thank you. Thanks. What's your name? Hi, I'm Kai. And my question is referencing back to one gentleman who talked about video games. Would you be able to share your experience working with Kingdom Hearts? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, it wasn't anything that different than doing the film. We went in, we both, you know, worked, and you, you go in, you record the things. I think the only thing I said to somebody earlier today that I think might have been a little different working on the games was they had a very... Um, broad reaching idea about what the game was going to be and how people would play it so they wanted you to have sp even more specifically than the film certain reactions that they wanted to get in the line readings because according to how the game was played that would be what would come up that was a little new and a little different because it was a little different than recording uh, the voicing for the film you're know, like ouch mm -hmm. they wanted you're really really upset ouch a slight prick ouch you know you just would pick like with a pen or something so there were those kind of differences you know that was basically for me yeah and, and also uh, you also had the feeling whereas with a movie uh everything was thrown out but one take that is it for in a specific line they were using almost every line that you recorded in different permutations throughout the game because the game changed with each player Perfect. Thank, thank you what's your name uh hi i'm krista um, I love you guys both. I just want to say you guys are awesome. And uh, I also had to ask, are there any humorous instance that, instance, uh, that occurred um, in the course of your whole, basically, career and that would you would like to share it with us? Like anything funny, blooper, anything? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, certainly. There's a lot of funny in our things. Whole in our whole career. whole <laughs> career. And also Broadway, too. Cause well, big. you're talking a lot of years here. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't really narrow it down with the time we have left. Yeah, but thank you for the question. Okay. Maybe later you can think about it and she can visit at the table. Okay. 
Hello, Hi, I'm Josh. Um, I'm a super fan of Nightmare Before Christmas, and without the movie, I wouldn't be able to perform on the Cinderella Castle stage every Halloween season. Cool. So I am so grateful for the work that you guys have accomplished, and you're such big inspiration. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Josh plays Oogie Boogie in the show at the park. So everyone. <laughs> Hi, um, uh, well, I'm not going to re reveal my real name, but my name is Triumph Wolfbane, and it's great to see you guys. In the movie, yeah, one of the songs that I really like best from it is the, of course, the Yogi Boogie song. I used to sing it as well. And uh, first question to Ken, um, how does it feel to be voicing a sack full of bugs? Marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you don't get to do that every day. <laughs> and uh, also, I was wondering, uh, maybe if we have time, if possible, can you sing the Oogie Boogie song, or? You can't. No, we don't have time, and no, I can't anyway, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's fine. It's great to meet you. Thank, Thank you. You too. Go listen to that CD. All right, we maybe have time for one or two more questions. What's your name? Uh, my name is Danica. And I just wanted to say, um, I'm here with my best friend, and we met actually through Cats, like a year, like two years ago. And that's actually the reason why we're here in Florida, because I'm from Canada. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much. We've seen the movie like a bazillion times, and uh, we were just curious, what's it like working with Michael Gruber? <laughs> Wonderful. You know, Michael had been in the show on Broadway, and a few of us, make sh long story short, were taken to England to film it there. And we had not worked together before then, but of course we all had done the same show. So it was really terrific. I mean, I think of many people that did Monka Strap in the show, they picked who, who they thought probably was the one who embodied it the most. I won't say the best, just for kindness to everybody else, but the most. And it was really great to play it with him because it was like playing it with the ultimate Monka Strap, you know. And he was terrific. Great to work with. Can I ask who your favorite character was? Deuteronomy. Well. <laughs> Come on, what? No, no. I think my favorite character in Cats, honestly, is Grizabella oh. because it's the most universal to everybody. Everybody can honestly understand what that's like. You're a little young, <laughs> but when you've life and faded and all those things either if it's only in a story we all can relate to that perfect thank you very much thank you You're welcome all right this unfortunately has to be our last question i'm so sorry i'm so sorry what's your name hi my name is rihanna um i was going now my friend ashley she couldn't make it here today so this is a question from her how did you think of Nightmare Before Christmas while it was in production? Did you think it would be as popular as it was today? Did you think it would become an instant classic? Or did you think it was just a weird, odd family movie that would just as, get popular and then just die out after some time? Well, I thought it was extraordinary. I didn't think it would be what it's become. I mean, there was no reason to think that. You know, even if it was popular, it didn't have to still have the kind of following it has now. But I thought it was certainly something amazing, and I realized, as we were saying about going there and, and, and we're, uh, working and seeing how they were doing it and how much time it took with the armatures and things, I knew something special was being created. I had no concept about what it would be or how it would be received at all. Yeah, it's very difficult to tell ahead of time. I mean, it's been that way with most of the things that I've been involved in, especially movies. I mean, sometimes you get a sense with a play through rehearsal, uh, oh, we're headed in the right direction, or oh my God, we're in big <laughs> trouble, we're doomed, doomed. Um, but with this, there's no way to know exactly what the finished product is going to be, much less what effect it's going to have on people. And in this case, uh, as with Ken, I, I had a chance to, I think we both did, you, to go de down in the depths of the building and watch them shooting on the different little sound stages. Um, they were shooting like four or five different sound stages at one time, different sets, different characters, or same characters. And it was mind boggling the kind of work that was being done. And so you knew, and the story, you saw all the storyboards and where the movie was going and how it was going to be shot, that it was something extraordinary, but you had, we had no idea whatsoever just how, how extraordinary it was and what kind of long-term effect it was going to have. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.